right. Our next presenter uh, is also from the Department of Natural Sciences, um, Sonia Takia uh, Arashiro. And Sonia is going to talk to us about the environmental dimension of antibiotic resistance. And I think Sonia probably has the most students who are presenting uh, next door uh, this morning as well. So, Sonia. Hello, can you hear me in the back? <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction, Marty, and it's so nice to be here. And today I'm gonna talk about a recent research that my students and I are currently doing in my laboratory. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm an environmental microbiologist. I'm not a clinical microbiologist. And my research uh, interests are in the applications of microorganisms in biotechnology for clean water, renewable energy, and healthy ecosystems. <laughs> the books that I published over the past seven years. So the first book was published in 2012, and this book lays out the molecular biological technologies that are used to detect microorganisms in the ocean. Um, Fungi in Extreme Environments was published this fall and received rave reviews from, um, from my colleagues in the field because this is the first book that actually described fungi in extreme environments in their biotechnological uh, significance. Um, microbial electrochemical technologies will be published in 2020. And, and, this, uh, and this book basically covers uh, microbial fuel cells, which you probably heard in, in, in the media. So going back to antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, Antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections, right? So they have been used as medical treatment for surgical procedures. So they revolutionized medicine, they saved millions of lives, and they changed the course of history. Now, while antibiotics were one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century, a significant threat to the achievement of antibiotic era is actually antibiotic resistance. And that's because Pathogenic bacteria have become resistant to antibiotics, making them very difficult to treat. Another reason is that antibiotic bacteria can also spread in the environment. So humans and animals are carriers of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Right? They are the main sources of antibiotic resistant bacteria in aquatic ecosystems. So these antibiotic resistant bacteria are excreted in the feces, right? And they are actually spread into the environment. Now, antibiotic resistant bacteria is spread among microorganisms through genetic exchange mechanisms, right? And that includes transformation, conjugation, and transduction. So here is a non-resistant bacteria. So this bacteria right here multiply in billions, and a few of them will mutate, right? And the mutations can actually make the bacteria drug resistant or antibiotic resistant. Now, so those drug resistant bacteria would then multiply in billions and they can actually be, be transferred into the environment, <coughs> they can be dispersed into the environment, and they can transfer their genes to non-resistant uh, non bacteria in the environment. So antibiotic resistant bacteria has been found in bigger palms, it has been found in wastewater treatment systems, in ponds, in streams, in lagoons, and there is also a possibility that this antibiotic resistant bacteria can seep into the groundwater, right, and contaminate the drinking water system. So today, there are a few data about the genotype and pattern of antibiotic resistance in aquatic environments. So for our project, we selected two aquatic ecosystems. The St. Clair River, which is right here, 
and the Lake St. Clair, which is right here. Now, <coughs> these two aquatic ecosystems cross the border of the US with Canada. It is a very important source of drinking water for over four million Southeast Michigan residents. And it is also a recipient of pollutants coming from drains and sewage discharges. And these pollutants include chemicals, organic and inorganic, and also microorganisms which are pathogenic or potentially pathogenic. All right, so here's another uh, slide right here showing you our study site, right? The St. Clair River is connected upstream, is located upstream, and the Lake St. Clair is actually located downstream. So we selected three sites from St. Clair River and three sites from Lake St. Clair. Now the six sites are in the vicinity of known pollution sources. So the goals of the project are to spotlight the prevalence of E. coli in Lake St. Clair and St. Clair River, as well as to estimate the antimicrobial resistance of the E. coli strain. So let's talk about E. coli. So E. coli is actually a member of a huge group of bacteria called the coliform bacteria. So the coliform bacteria, like E. coli, are commensal members of the gastrointestinal tract, right? So here is our gastrointestinal tract, and here are the microorganisms that you will find, right? So E. coli, Escherichia coli, is actually one of them, right? So E. coli can be pathogenic, so some strains of E. coli are pathogenic, some strains of E. coli are opportunistic pathogens, and some are non-pathogenic. All right, so as a commensal member of the gastrointestinal tract, E. coli is actually subjected to antibiotic pressure, right? So we take, e. coli, we take antibiotics, and so these antibiotics eventually, they will go into the gastrointestinal tract. So the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are subjected to antibiotic pressure. They are also almost present in fecal matter, right? So whenever you poop, right, there's E. coli, right, in, in the fecal matter. And because of their short persistence in the environment, E. coli has been used as a gold standard <coughs> for the detection of fecal pollution in water. Now, E. coli is also the cause of the vast majority of urinary tract infections. So my students collected surface water from St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair and brought that to the lab. So they filtered the water, right, potentially containing E. coli, and then they transferred the filter containing E. coli onto an MTEC molten auger and incubated it. Now after incubation, the colonies of E. coli grew on the plates and they screened them and purified them and then confirmed them as E. coli using two tests the lactose fermentation test and the indole test. Now, out of 600 uh, E. coli strains that we've actually collected, 500 of those strains were confirmed as E. coli. All right? So <coughs> the 500 strains were subjected to phenotypic evaluation of antibiotic resistance using 12 different antibiotics. And they've also been subjected to screening of 12 antibiotic resistant genes and the presence of class one in Egron integrase. All right, so here's the first result, right, on this project, the phenotypic evaluation of antibiotic resistance. So we found out that all of the E. coli strains from St. Lake, St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair <coughs> are multi-drug resistant. So meaning that they are resistant to more than one antibiotics. So they are resistant to recomcin, streptomycin, gentamicin, ampicillin, and tetracycline. We also calculated the multiple antibiotic resistance of each of those strains, and we found that 38% of the strains are high risk. High risk meaning that they're high risk in terms of transferring this antibiotic resistance to other organisms in the environment. So this slide just shows you the different primers that we use to actually screen for antibiotic resistance in class one in Tigran Cassette. All right, so on the right, you will see a gel electrophoresis of cat C gene. So as you can see here, the gene is about 500 base pairs, and it is actually present, and it's actually present in all of the E. coli strains. 
So what we did next was to what we did next was to actually sequence each of the PCR product and compare the DNA sequence to the antibiotic uh, resistant gene sequences from Janvan. Right? So we did a blast search. So this slide right here shows you a blast search for CAT-C. And as you can see here, the tetracycline resistant genes that we have for E. coli closely match those of the uncultured bacterium and the close relative Shigella sone, which are isolated from various uh, environments, such as farm soil, water sample, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the result of the antibiotic resistant genes from E. coli, and this result tells us that the PCR amplification and DNA sequencing actually confirms the data of the phenotypic antibiotic assay in that all of the strains are multi-drug resistant, right? So in the study right here, uh, each of the E. coli strains carries four or more resistant genes. So the next thing that we wanted to do is to see whether each of these E. coli strains actually carry class one integrons, right? So what are those class one integrons? Now class one integrons are key players in antibiotic resistance, right? In that they capture and express diverse genes. So they are actually embedded either in the transposon or in promiscuous plasmids, allowing them to be transferred laterally into a wide range of microorganisms. So what is shown here on top is actually a genetic map of class one integron. And the antibiotic resistant genes are actually located in this gene cassette right here, right? So what we've done is that we've actually used primers, right, to amplify the class one integron. And here is the result of that. So this is the primer that we use. Here are the PCR products of the gene cassette. So what we found is that 40% of the E. coli strains that we have actually carry the class one integron, right? So when we PCR amplify them, right, the gene products, the, the amplicon size is actually variable, right, depending on the E. coli strain. So the size of the gene cassette region actually range from 0.7 to 3.5 kilo base pair. So what we've done next is to sequence each of these PCR products, find out the genes that these gene cassettes actually carry. And we found out <coughs> that there are actually eight different uh, antibiotic resistant genes, and they belong to five classes of antibiotics, including aminoglycosides, cetracycline, chloramphenicol, beta-lactam, and trimethopterate. So the most commonly found class one integrins were those for aminoglycosides, Oops. Good. aminoglycosides, right, and tetracycline. Now, aminoglycoside is a growth promoter, right? So they basically add this antibiotic to the animal feed, right, to induce growth of animals. And aminoglycoside is an antibiotic that treats UTI. So although our research is preliminary and we've only done this for a year, right, <clears throat> this study actually demonstrated the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistant resistance in St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair, right? So it serves as a reservoir of resistant genes and also a medium for the spread and evolution of resistant genes. So therefore, knowledge of the sources and mechanisms of antibiotic resistance are very important to reduce the impact of antibiotic resistance in public health. Also, the dynamics of antibiotic resistance needed to be understood, and this includes uh, the integration of the data of the diverse mobile genetic elements, as well as the dissemination of virus, uh, various mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer, oops, horizontal gene transfer between bacterial cells and the environment. Thank you.